I don't even know if I have anything to say about any of these books. So this should be interesting. Hi, beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. And if you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for coming back to another video. I always appreciate your support. Today, we are here to do my final October wrap up. I don't know about any of y'all, but October felt like the longest reading month. In fact, it felt like a reading year. It feels like so much time has passed between October 1st and now. I've mentioned this in a few other videos, but I was feeling slumpy. I would say for the majority of October, if not the majority, then at least for sure for the second half of the month. And that made it really hard for me to fully connect with or invest in any type of story. And it also definitely slowed down the amount of stories that I was reading because I just was not necessarily in the mood to pick anything up. So I actually only have five books to talk to you about today. And I think that this is probably going to be the least amount of books that I've talked about in any mid-month or end-of-month wrap-up so far this year. That is how much I was affected by my mood and my lack of interest in reading. That also has the adverse side effect of the fact that I really don't have too terribly much to say about the books that I'm going to talk to you about today. Now obviously my feelings about these books were affected by the slump but also some of them I just don't think were what I was hoping or wanting them to be and so that also like kind of further impacted my slumpy feelings because they weren't good enough to kind of raise me up out of the slump. I'm gonna do my best to talk to you about all of the books that I read in the second half of October. It might not be great so I apologize about that but in my very first October wrap-up I asked y'all what you thought about wrap-ups and if you wanted me to continue making them and everybody who commented overwhelmingly said yes and so I'm here bringing you this end of month wrap up even if it's very lackluster. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. The very first book that I completed after my mid-month October wrap up was Secrets of a Charmed Life by Susan Meisner. I picked this up because for Spookopoly I landed on the prompt to read a book that was mostly green on the cover and as you can see this is a very green book. This is a historical fiction and it was also kind of fitting my mood because I had been reading almost exclusively thrillers, mysteries throughout the month and I thought that this would be a good palate cleanser and I have really enjoyed Susan Meisner in the past. Unfortunately this did not quite do it for me. So first I'm going to say that even though there is a present perspective and a past perspective, the present perspective was almost entirely useless. It follows Kendra. She is an American student studying abroad. She's studying it at Oxford. She is about done with her course and for her final she wants to interview somebody who survived the London Blitz. And so she is kind of put in contact with a woman named Isabel who is going to be sharing her experience with Kendra even though up until now Isabel has been pretty silent on her experiences. So we don't know why she's decided to open up to Kendra and as soon as Isabel begins telling her story. We soon realize that Isabel isn't really who she says she is and that she's been hiding a lot of secrets and it goes from there. The vast majority of this story is told in 1940s England. There's very little of the present perspective in here. It was entirely unnecessary to tell this story that way. Kendra herself did not end up being an important player. Kendra was virtually useless to this whole story and even Isabel's reasons for telling her story to Kendra didn't really make a whole lot of sense and they weren't very impactful to me overall. So in all honesty the present day perspective had almost nothing to do with this story so I'm not really going to talk about it any further. I'm just going to focus on the 1940s perspective where we are following Emmy. She is a 15 year old teenager who has dreams of opening her own bridal shop. In her free time she kind of sketches wedding dresses and it is her dream to see her dresses line bridal shops all over and she of course wants to own her own and she's in the process of making those dreams come true. She has recently got a job as a seamstress at a local bridal shop and the owner of the bridal shop says that her cousin who is kind of like a fashion designer may be willing to take on Emmy as an apprentice and so Emmy is super excited but of course we are just now getting into the height of World War II and and London is under threat of attack. And so Emmy's mom wants to send Emmy and her younger sister Julia away to the countryside to get them out of London. Emmy of course does not want to go. She wants nothing to do with this. She wants to stay because she's in the process of making her dreams come true. But her mom is having none of it. And so Emmy and Julia end up staying with this lovely older woman named Charlotte. Charlotte treats them very very well. She loves them like her own daughter. She has a wonderful home, wonderful people. So they are not in a bad situation at all. But one day Emmy receives a letter from the woman that owns the bridal shop and says hey my cousin is here in town and he definitely wants to meet with you and look at your designs and he might want you to apprentice under him and so Emmy of course is going to go back to London because she wants to make this happen but her younger sister Julia who is about I want to say seven or eight at this time figures out what Emmy is going to do and she says if you do not take me to London I'm going to tell Charlotte what you're doing and I'm going to put the kibosh on this whole thing. Emmy has no intention of taking Julia but Julia wakes up in the middle of the night when Emmy is about to escape and so she has no choice but to take Julia and the story kind of goes from there as they are heading to London and then they are separated and something happens to Julia and Emmy doesn't know what. Julia is missing nobody 
nobody knows where she is. And so the vast majority of this story is kind of Emmy living her life trying to find Julia. And overall, I would say that my reading experience of this was fairly positive. I enjoyed following Emmy's story, but this just did not pack the punch that I wanted to see. I was not necessarily as invested in Emmy and Julia's story as I might have been other Susan Meisner stories. I also was kind of left wondering what the point of the story was, what the overall message I was supposed to get from the story was. So ultimately, it was just a little bit lackluster for me. So this is certainly not my favorite Susan Meisner. It is one of her older works. I believe it was published in 2015. And I've definitely enjoyed some of her more recent works more than this. So I'm not giving up on Susan Meisner. Not at all. I already have another of her books on my shelves that I plan to read. This one just didn't quite do it for me. So I gave it a three stars. Next, I picked up The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mandana. The only reason why I picked this up is because it was October's book club selection for the Bookworm Bitches book club. It is a book club that I moderate on Goodreads. And essentially, this is just kind of a heartwarming and sweet touching story. It follows our main character Mika Moon and she is a witch. She is kind of living a very lonely solitary life just because witches in this time feel like they have to live apart and not really have any contact with each other in order to keep each other safe. So once every quarter all of the witches kind of converge and meet with each other, catch up with each other, share spells and things like that. But aside from that they don't get together and so Mika really doesn't have anybody to discuss her witchiness with. But she does pass the time by making magical videos on YouTube. And of course everybody who watches her videos does not believe that this magic is real. They believe that it's just smoke and mirrors basically. But one day somebody watches her videos and knows in fact that Mika is a witch. And they contact Mika and they say we need your help because we have three young witches here with us and we need somebody to help teach them how to control their powers because somebody very important is coming here and we cannot have them losing control and outing themselves basically. And of course Mika is very skeptical about this. Like how could anybody possibly realize that she is a witch? But she goes to this house and it kind of goes from there as she falls in love with the three girls that she is teaching and she falls in love with their caretakers and she finds a home with them the first time she ever has really had a home and you know this was just a delightfully charming wholesome heartwarming type of story it is exactly kind of like what you would expect it to be I have heard a lot of people compare this to the house in the cerulean sea by tj clune I've never even read that story so I can't necessarily validate the connection but just based on what I know of the house in the cerulean sea I would say the comparison is accurate I would say it was kind of like that in combination with mary poppins those are kind of like the vibes that I got from this story at its core it really is about found family and love and forgiveness personally what really kept me into and invested in the story was the developing relationship between Mika and the girl's main caretaker who is kind of like the grump and he doesn't want Mika there and he doesn't trust her and then it's about their developing relationship which I really liked. So overall I just had a really fun time listening to this and even though it's not really something that's going to leave a lasting impression on me I'm not mad that I read it. I gave it a 3.5 because I don't necessarily think it was meant enough to be a three stars but it definitely was not a four stars and like I said it's not something that's going to really leave a lasting impression on me so I gave it a 3.5 and I would highly recommend if you're in the mood for something just sweet and touching. This is definitely one to read. All right and then I picked up The Marriage Act by John Mars. I picked this up because yet again it satisfied a spookopoly role to read a science fiction or a book with science fiction elements and I really enjoyed The Passengers by John Mars when I read it earlier this year so I was very excited to get into this one and unfortunately this was not it y'all. In fact I think that this is the very first book that I've rated below a three stars in 2023. Now I could certainly blame this on the slump. I could say that if I had not been in a partial reading slump I would have enjoyed this much more but I just don't think so and I'm really bummed about it too because I really think that this has put me so far off reading any further John Mars that I'm not going to pick any of his books up despite having enjoyed The Passengers in the past. So this is set in our world but in the future. It doesn't really give an exact year in which this was set but because it mentions COVID and being at least a decade in the past I would say that this is probably set at least 15, 20, possibly even 30 years in the future and it is set in London. London basically and in London at this time it is being ruled by a very traditionalist government who believes that marriage is the answer to everything. People are going to live longer, they are going to be happier, the economy is going to be better and so the Sanctity of Marriage Act was introduced that gives a lot of benefits to people who are married and it incentivizes marriage. People are now getting married even if they don't want to for these benefits like they're in marriages of convenience specifically for these benefits and those who are married have the opportunity to upgrade to what is called a smart marriage and basically smart marriages are monitored like cameras are placed in your home and they are able to listen in on your conversations and if there's any kind of detection of problems in your marriage your marriage gets upgraded so there's like level one level two level three and I think it's level two that if you get upgraded to a level two you are upgraded to a relationship responder and that means somebody actually comes and can live in your home to monitor your relationship and at the end of this time that relationship responder can make a determination on whether or not you should divorce so it is definitely like big brother interfering in marriage and things like that. I of course 
found this concept extremely fascinating, but the execution just was not for me. And I knew it pretty much instantly when I started this book that this was not going to be something that I loved or connected to because this book does something that I absolutely hate in thrillers where you are tossed into a bunch of different character perspectives and you're never able to really fully connect or get to know each one. So if I remember correctly, this book follows the perspectives of five different individuals. A few of them are in marriages and it is about their experience being in a smart marriage and things like that. Then one of the perspectives is a relationship responder. So he is somebody that actually goes in and monitors marriages. There is also somebody who is part of a resistance group who is against the marriage act. And then there is somebody who is part of the government and helping to enact all of this stuff. So there are a lot of people, there are a lot of things going on. And while every single different perspective had a different narrator in the audiobook, it didn't really help anything because it didn't help me connect these perspectives. This is not supposed to be a character driven story. This is supposed to be a plot based story and it definitely reads like that. And so I didn't care about any of the characters. I found most of them quite unlikable. I wasn't really invested in most of them. I only was really interested in one, maybe two of the perspectives. And so the other ones just kind of floated in one ear and out the other. And it didn't help that one of the narrators, he narrated a perspective in the Atlas Six. I didn't like him in the Atlas Six and I definitely didn't like him here. And so all of this came together to really affect my enjoyment of the story. And I just really wanted it done. I just think the execution of it could have been done so much better. There could have been so much more depth. And so I ended up giving this a 2.5 stars and I can't even believe it because I was not expecting that at all. So I gave it a 2.5. I'm certainly not going to be buying it to put on my shelves. And I don't think that I will be continuing with John Mars as an author because this was actually his newest release, his newest release. And I absolutely did not love it. So 2.5, we're moving on. Luckily, the next book was much more of a hit. My Library Alone for Triptych by Karen Slaughter finally came in from the library. That was supposed to be a September read, but the library hold was so long. It didn't come in until the end of October. And thankfully, I really loved it. I was kind of worried about it because first of all, I've been moving very far away from detective fiction. And this is the start of her Will Trent series. And Will Trent is a detective with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. So I was kind of worried how I was going to connect to it. Also, some of her earlier books like this don't necessarily grab me as much as her later books, and especially not as much as her standalones. But I was actually quite invested in this story. In fact, I ended up finishing it on a day I wasn't planning on finishing it because I just wanted to know what was going to happen. So like I said, this follows Will Trent of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And in this story, he is working alongside a local police department to solve crimes of what could potentially be a serial killer. So you're getting Will Trent's perspective. You're also getting the perspective of one of the detectives that he's working with. And you're also getting the third perspective of a man named John. This man was actually just recently released from prison. He's in his late 30s now. He went to prison when he was 16 years old for raping and killing a 15 year old girl. And he's been in prison ever since he was just released on parole. So naturally, he's just trying to rebuild his life. He's working hard. He's keeping his head down, but he's kind of under suspicion for the crimes that are going on. And so you're following his perspective and what actually happened in the past and how that connects to some of the people that are investigating the current crime. And ultimately, I thought that Karen Slaughter brought all of the perspectives together really beautifully. As per usual, this story has Karen Slaughter's natural darkness. It was certainly very, very gritty. There's certainly a lot of terminology in there that you would not hear in civilized conversation, but is very much accurate to the world in which Karen Slaughter's characters inhabit. Thankfully, I really enjoyed it. I gave it a four stars. I'm very excited to continue in the Will Trent series. And I just realized that I'm not holding up Triptych. I have the book and I just have not gotten it. So I apologize, but it should be up here for you if editing Brittany does her job correctly. But yes, I gave it a four stars. I think it was a very solid start to the series. Definitely more solid than the start to her Grant County series, which I didn't love, but I've actually really enjoyed the other books in that series. So I'm hoping that this one just keeps getting stronger and stronger. She actually released a new Will Trent book this year. And so that series is strong and it just keeps going. And I believe that there is now an adaptation of it. I don't know if I'm going to watch it or not, but I'm very, very excited to be continuing in this series. Next, I picked up The Prisoner by B.A. Paris. This again satisfied a spookopoly prompt for a poll pick. I posted a poll in a Discord that I'm a part of, and this was the winner. This follows our main character, Amelie, and at the very start of the story, we are following her as she is basically being abducted. She is being kidnapped and she is put in a room. It is very dark. There is no light. All that's in this room is a bed and a little bathroom for her to go into. She kind of has some idea of who kidnapped her and why, but she doesn't really have a lot of answers, and she knows that her husband was also kidnapped with her as well. So you're following her in the present day after she has been kidnapped, and then you're following the past perspectives in the months and weeks leading up to this kidnapping. I actually had a really solid reading experience with this. It was kind of just what I was looking for in terms of the fact that it was easy to read. It was compulsively readable. It kind of fit the vibe and the mood that I was going for, but it didn't really take a lot of brain power. So this is certainly not something that you're really going to connect to. It is nothing substantial. It is very short, very fast. And so because of that, I only gave it a three stars because this is not something that's going to 
leave a super lasting impression but I had a good time. It's not my favorite BA Paris and I certainly think a lot of her other books are stronger than this one but I'm not mad that I read it. I'm glad that I've gotten another BA Paris off my list. I would say that my main criticism of this story is simply because it was so short and the transitions between the past and the present perspectives were very quick and very jarring. So we would be in the past perspective for like two pages and then jump back to the present and then jump back to the past and it happened over and over and I kind of wanted just a little bit more depth and substance especially with the past perspective because I mean in the present day there's really not a whole lot going on right you're following the main character as she is trapped in a room she's trying to figure out what's happening she's trying to escape she's trying to get all of these answers so it's really in the past perspective that you're supposed to be getting a lot of answers to what is happening in the present I would have liked a lot more answers in the past perspective so I think that this could have probably been beefed up at least 50 to 100 pages to give it that more depth and substance and then of course at some point in the story you do figure out like what has happened and all of the answers are revealed and stuff like that and ultimately like I said it was an overall pretty positive reading experience and I had a good time with it. It's just not something that's going to stick with me and already I've kind of forgotten a lot of the major plot points in here and stuff like that but still this is exactly what I was looking for when I picked this up and it's something that I would still recommend especially for a good palate cleanser if you're looking for something that's not going to be too brain heavy this is it and completely opposite of The Prisoner something that was far more brain heavy and the final book that I read in the month of October was Happiness Falls by Angie Kim. So first I want to dissuade anybody who's going into this thinking that it is a primarily a mystery slash thriller. It is in no way a thriller whatsoever and I feel like the mystery was secondary like it was a catalyst to a lot of the things that happen in the story and what you learn in the story but overall the mystery itself was kind of secondary to everything else that goes on. This at its core is more of a literary family drama than anything. I feel like in general even though it wasn't quite what I was expecting it is something that I would overall have enjoyed more had I not been feeling still kind of slumpy at the time that I read it but still it felt a little bit flat. It was still beautifully written don't get me wrong. I think Angie Kim is a very talented author. In fact when I'm reading her stories I'm getting very much modern day Jodie Picoult vibes. Maybe kind of mixed with maybe Gabrielle Zevin. I've only read one Gabrielle Zevin book so I'm not an expert but Angie Kim's writing in this kind of reminded me of Gabrielle Zevin's writing in Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. So I very much enjoy Angie Kim's writing. She's obviously very intelligent and clever. There was a lot of research that went into the story but some of what was happening in the story made it hard for me to like connect and stay interested in it. So this story like I said is a family drama. It follows a Korean American family that's comprised of a mom, a dad, two 20 year old twins named John and Mia and then a special needs 14 year old boy named Eugene. And one day Adam takes Eugene to the park. This is a regular occurrence. They live right by it. It's not very far away but one day Eugene returns without their father. And Eugene is non-speaking meaning he does not have the ability to really communicate with his family so he cannot communicate what actually happened to their dad. And so of course a police investigation is started and it kind of goes from there. But like I said the mystery surrounding the missing father was more of a secondary plot point and it was more of a catalyst for more of the philosophical issues that happen in this story that are meant to make you think. It's meant to make you think about language, about how we treat or speak to those who cannot speak or who cannot speak our language well, how we treat people in general with a disability, the assumptions we make, the biases we carry. There is no doubt that this book was very well written and very well researched but this philosophical analytical aspect to the story kind of made me as the reader disconnected from everything overall. And aside from all of the underlying philosophical things such as you know language and how we treat people with disabilities and stuff like that there was actually in the story a scientific examination of happiness. We kind of learned some of the things that the missing dad was working on in the weeks and months leading up to his disappearance and he was looking into happiness and I actually find that really really fascinating. I love that stuff but somehow the inclusion of it in this story just further distanced me from everything that was happening. It made this more of a scientific philosophical book than it made for an actual hard-hitting emotional family drama slash mystery which is what I was wanting when I was going into it if that makes sense. The portions on happiness kind of felt jarring. It didn't feel like they flowed seamlessly throughout everything. It added to the disconnect that I was feeling and on top of that I really didn't love the ending. I kind of felt like the ending was somewhat ambiguous and it wasn't ambiguous in a good way and so I felt really unsatisfied with the ending of the story overall and like I said I do think that I would have enjoyed it somewhat better had I not been in a slump, a little mental fog and I did love some of the themes in here especially regarding happiness. It just didn't work cohesively enough for me to come together to make a solid family drama that I was looking for. I still can't quite pinpoint what my feelings on this book are. I'm kind of leading to a 3.5 just because I do think it was memorable. I do think it was well written. It was extremely intelligent but the emotional connection just wasn't there for me and again I'm not holding up Happiness Falls and I have it so apparently I just cannot be bothered to pick up these books. I'm sorry y'all. I am the worst booktuber ever. See here you go. Here it is. Proof that I have it. All right y'all that is it. Those are all the books that I read in the second half of October. Please comment down below 
and let me know if you have read any of these books and what your thoughts are. I would love to know. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me a smiley face emoji in honor of Happiness Falls by Angie Kim. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I can do. And I always love connecting with you in my videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with the books that I talked about in this video. But until next time, y'all. Bye.